Hi, everyone. Uh, new hairdo, new me. What's good? Um, we're going to try something different for this for this next set of of uh, episodes or whatever you want to call it, uh, videos. I'm basically going to be responding to people who have interesting things to say about existential topics like our beloved Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, etc. So this first video I'm going to be responding to is called Jordan Peterson on the existence of God. There's no straight line between faith and belief or God itself. I feel like this is going to be a very Nietzschean take. Biological meat bag to another. This is an eight minute video. Who is God then? So. Let's try to sneak up to this question if it's at all possible. Is it possible to even talk about this? Well, it better be because otherwise there's no communicating about it. (laughs) It has to be something that can be brought down to earth. Well, we might be too dumb to bring it down. It's not just ignorant. It's also sinful right? So, because there's not knowing, and then there's not wanting to know or refusing to know. Yeah. And so you might say, well, could you extract God from a description of the objective world, right? Is is God just... Well, first of all, the the asking of trying to extract God is a very transactional frame in the first place. Let's, <laughs> let's note the paradigm from which the grammar emerges. Right, this idea of extracting God already presupposes a sense of separation. Um, it's a very manipulative paradigm, and I don't even mean manipulative in a negative way. We have to manipulate water so that it's not salty, so we can drink it. Right, one must manipulate in order to survive. But manipulation comes from what Eric Fromm calls the the having mode instead of the being mode, where you know, we have to have things in order to survive, but that's very separate from the question of who do we want to be, right? Um, I might have to have a car in order to survive, but a car will not make me wise. And it seems to me that situating the question of God, which is a fundamental question of being, not of having, what do we need to, who do we need to be in order to relate to, let's say, the transcendent principle? That's a very different mode orientation than a manipulative extracting transactional language so just be very cautious about how we talk about the transcendent principle um and i would caution us against using transactional language to talk about something which cannot be separated from us fundamentally but we'll see what else he has to say so (laughs) the 43 seconds and let's see what happens but just the ultimate unity of 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 the natural reality and I would say, well, in a sense, there's some truth in that, but but not exactly, because God, in the highest sense, is the spirit that you must emulate in order to thrive. How's that for a biological definition? Spirit is a pattern. The spirit that you must emulate in order to thrive. So it's a, it's a kind of, uh, in one sense, when we say the human spirit, hmm? it's that. It's an animating principle. Yeah. It's a meta. It's a pattern. And you might say, well, what's the pattern? Okay, well, I can tell you that to some degree. Imagine that like you're gripped by beauty, you're gripped by admiration. So, and you can just notice this. This isn't propositional. You have to notice it. It's like, oh, turns out I admire that person. Hmm. So what does that mean? Well, it means I would like to be like him or her. That's what admiration means. It means there's something about the way they are that compels imitation, another instinct, or inspires respect or awe even. Mm -hmm. Okay, what is that that grips you? Well, I don't know. Well, let's say, okay, fine, but it grips you and you want to be like that. Kids hero worship, for example, and so do adults for that matter, unless they become (laughs) entirely cynical. I worship quite a a few heroes. Yeah, well, there you go. Proudly. Yes, well, there you go. And there's no... That worship, that celebration and, and proclivity to imitate is worship. That's what worship means most fundamentally. Now imagine you took the set of all admirable people and you extracted out AI learning. Okay. You extracted out the central features of what constitutes admirable. 
And then you did that repeatedly until you purified it to what was most admirable. That's as good as you're going to get in, in terms of a representation of God. And you might say, well, I don't believe in that. It's like, well, what do you mean? Yeah. It's not a set of propositional facts. It's not a scientific theory about the structure of the objective world. And then I could say something about that, too, because I've been thinking about this a lot, especially since talking to Richard Dawkins. It's like, okay, the postmodernist types, going back way before Derrida and Foucault, maybe back to Nietzsche, who I admire greatly, by the way, Yes, says, God is dead. Like, okay. But Nietzsche said, God is dead, and we have killed him, and we'll not find enough water to wash away all the blood. So that was Nietzsche. He's no fool. He's got a way with words. He certainly does. And so then you think, okay, well, we killed the transcendent. <laughs> well, what does that mean for science? Well, it frees it up because all that nonsense about a deity is just the idiot superstition that stops the scientific um, what process from moving forward. That's basically the new atheist claim, something like that. It's like, wait a second. Do you believe in the transcendent if you're a scientist? And the answer is, well, not only do you believe in it, you believe in it more than anything else, because if you're a scientist, you believe in what objects to your theory more than you believe in your theory. Now, we got to think that through very carefully. So your theory describes the world, and as far as you're concerned, your description of the world is the world. But because you're a scientist, you think, well, even though that's my description of the world, and that's what I believe, there's something beyond what I believe. So here, here he's describing the mystery. Mystery and the transcendent are sort of synonymous here. There's something that contains us, which is the, which is the transcendent, mysterious-ness, suchness of being itself, or beyond being itself, if you want to... Um, if you want to sort of use uh, Nishitani's model of the no, no thingness beyond God, um, but we also contain the transcendent, right? There's sort of like the cosmos contains us and we contain the cosmos simultaneously. And I think that's what he's getting at here. And that's the object. And so I'm going to throw my theory against the object and see where it'll break. Although it's odd that he, ta he uses it, he uses object to describe that mystery because in a sense it's not object it's not an object and in fact conceiving of it as an object is sort of part of the problem it's part of what creates the sense of alienation and atomization that came out of the enlightenment and to which the postmodernists are responding or reflecting in a way because to describe the mysterious transcendent principle as an object is in a sense to freeze it and to to eliminate the vitality from it. If something is an object, it's sort of frozen and rigid in, in, in time. I think a better analogy is an analogy that I love, which is related to music and to dance and to singing and to art in general, where there's a relational aspect between the, let's say, scientists and the 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 process because it's not really a thing right it's a process that the scientist is studying and observing i mean we see this in quantum physics right um so i wouldn't describe it as an object because in fact the it is precisely the no thingness of the mystery and the transcendent that we are forced to be in awe of you you, you cannot fix it you cannot pin it down this is ultimately i think what the story of Jacob wrestling with the angel before his name was changed to Israel is actually about. You cannot pin down the mystery. And so it's not an object at all. It's a living, vital process, which is present within you and present within me and also beyond us simultaneously. And then I'm going to use the evidence of the break as a source of new information to revitalize my theory. So here he's talking about breaking frame, right? Which is something that John Fervicki also talks about in his series After Socrates, which I would highly recommend you go check out if you haven't checked it out before. But um, breaking frame is what happens in jazz, right? Where you're freestyling with other people and what they are doing influence you, influences you, inspires you to change what you're doing. If I'm, a, if I'm playing 
scales on a guitar, for example, I'm responding to what the drummer is doing. I'm responding to what the cello player is doing. I'm responding to what the the bassist, bass guitar player is doing. I'm responding to what the singer is doing. But there's this, it, it's not an object, right? It's not a thing. It's a, it's a process. And in fact, this is part of the challenge or shortcoming, whatever you want to call it, of the Enlightenment, was, was that it objectified everything. And that objectification arguably is what killed God. And that's what Nietzsche is. That's what Nietzsche is protesting in a way. And so it's ironic that Peterson, Dr. Peterson would respond to um, or, or would, would encourage us to search for the transcendent by using objectified language because it's sort of precisely the, the problem, precisely what caused some of our shortcomings in the first place as a, as a civilization. So as a scientist, you have to posit the existence of the ontological transcendent before you can move forward at all. But more, you have to posit that contact with the ontological transcendent, annoying though it is because it upsets your apple cart, is exactly what will in fact set you free. So then you accept the proposition that there is a transcendent reality and that, the, that contact with that transcendent reality is redemptive in the most fundamental sense, because if it wasn't, well, why would you bother making contact with it? You're going to make everything worse or better. Why does the uh, contact with the transcendent set you free as a scientist? Because you assume that, you assume, I mean, freedom in the most fundamental sense. It's like, well, freedom from want, freedom from disease, freedom from ignorance, right? That it informs you. So it's the, the logos in it. of science. Now, it's interesting that he says freedom from ignorance, because, of course, when we look to the Socratic traditions, Socrates was known as the most wise guy, wisest guy of his time, because he knew that he did not know, right? And so there is this idea of learned, learned ignorance, ignorance, which is a virtue, right? Which, which again, is a part of uh, Verbeke's series after Socrates, which I highly encourage all of you to check out. So I'm curious if he's going to explore ignorance um, more deeply here. I mean, there's a Zen tradition which has a different take on ignorance, which has a different relationship with ignorance. There's books by, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, and I'll try to uh, include the link to the books in the bio, but there's this famous Korean Zen monk who wrote a book called Only Don't Know, right? Uh, who wrote another book called Dropping Ashes on the Buddha, which is all about really accepting that you don't know all the way down. Um, and opening yourself to that instead of being terrorized by it. And so I, I'm, I'm curious if he's going to expand upon what he means from freedom from, from ignorance. And, and I suppose that is a kind of freedom from ignorance, um, what I just described. But I don't know if he means it in that same way. So we'll see. It is definitely that. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the direction, let's say, the directionality of science. That's a narrative direction, not a scientific direction. And then the question is, what is the narrative? Well, it posits a transcendent reality. It posits that the transcendent reality is corrective. It posits that our knowledge structures should be regarded with humility. It posits that you should bow down in the face of, of the transcendent evidence. And you have to take a vow. You know this as a scientist. You have to take a vow to follow that path if you're going to be a real scientist. It's like the truth, no matter what. And that means you posit the truth as a redemptive force. Well, what does redemptive mean? Well, why bother with science? Well, so people don't starve, so people can move about more effectively, so life can be more abundant, right? So it's all ensconced within an underlying ethic. So the, re the reason I, I was saying that while we were talking about belief in God, it's like, this is a very complicated topic, right? Do you believe in a transcendent reality? So, you, okay, now let's say you buy the argument I just made on the natural front, and you say, yeah, yeah, that's just nature. That's not God. And then I'd say, well, what makes you think you know what nature is? Like, see, the th problem with that argument is that it, it already presumes a materialist, a reductionist materialist objective view of what constitutes nature. But if you're a scientist, you're going to think, well, in the final analysis, I don't know what nature is. I certainly don't know its origin or destination point. I don't know its teleology. I'm really ignorant about nature. And so when I say it's nothing but nature, I shouldn't mean it's nothing but what I understand nature to be. So I could say, will we have a fully reductionist account of 
cognitive processes? And the answer to that is yes, but by the time we do that, our understanding of matter will have transformed so much that what we think of as reductionist now won't look anything like what we think of reductionism now. Matter isn't... Not even that, but... Again, I'm just thinking of quantum physics. I, I could be totally wrong, but I don't think there's any state at which we arrive where we are able to fully comprehend or capture the, in a reductive way at least, um, the totality of being itself. <laughs> so, just want to say that. Dead dust. I don't know what it is. I have no idea what it is. Matter is what matters. There's a definition. That's a very weird definition. But the notion that we have, you know, that if you're a reductionist, a materialist reductionist, that you can reduce the complexity of what is to your assumptions about the nature of matter, yeah. that's not a scientific You're proposition. specific. Okay, so that was basically the end of the video. And thank you to Lex Friedman and Jordan Peterson for having that conversation so that we might talk about it, discuss. Um, I, I, I think I ultimately, I ultimately agree with much of what Peterson has said here. I just think that the language that he uses is still wrapped up in the same paradigm he's trying to undermine. Um, and there's a, <laughs> there's a paradox. Actually, I don't know if it's a paradox. It, might, it actually might be more of a contradiction in this case um, that's present in that. So. Yeah, that's my take. Let's begin with uh, a challenge here. I think that Dr. Peterson is strawmanning a little bit. He says that people uh, people claim that you should be harmless. People claim that you shouldn't try to win, right? And in fact, that is what some people say, for sure. But other people are actually saying that the entire paradigm of winning and losing is fundamentally problematic. And it's actually fundamentally problematic because it doesn't speak to or embody the very transcendent principle that Dr. Peterson himself has spoken of or, or, or alluded to when speaking about God. It's like the paradigm of us versus them, us versus them dominating your opponent, defeating your opponent as the source from which you get your sense of self-worth, that paradigm, um, which is what, you know, John Vervicki calls adversarial processing as opposed to opponent processing, is not, in fact, how civilization has uh, emerged. It's not, in fact, how civilization has sh been shaped. It is not adversarial processing that afforded the creation of language, for example, or any other large technology that requires the cooperation between multiple people in order to exist in the first place. And it's this reducing of everything in our world to an us versus them. I need to defeat you. I need to dominate you. I need to prove that I uh, uh, am superior to you. I need to win the game, right? Think about James Carson's brilliant text, uh, Finite and Infinite Games. If you haven't read this, this is this is a brilliant book. And he says that the purpose of a finite game is to is to end the game, right? Most games are finite games. Basketball, the purpose of the game is to win. And when you win, you end the game. Right? The purpose of football is to win. And when you win, you end the game. But the purpose of the infinite game, and the infinite game, everyone, is what understanding or being in right relationship with the transcendent principle is all about, with what you might call God is all about. The infinite game is not about winning. The infinite game actually goes beyond the paradigm of winning and losing in the first place. The purpose of the infinite game is to keep the game in play and to know that you contain the cosmos and the cosmos contains you simultaneously and to act in such a manner that you keep the game in play. So you actually don't want to win that game because to win that game, first of all, it's impossible to win that game, but to, to have the arrogance to think that you could win that game is actually incredibly toxic because it's, it's going to, it's going to, create within you a sense of atomization and a sense of fracturing and a sense of aloneness that will cause you to suffer. Um, and not the kind of suffering that every human being has to sort of carry as, as a function of being human, it's sort of unnecessary suffering. Um, and you'll probably also end up inflicting unnecessary suffering on others. 
Okay. So we're off to the races already. No. Wrong. You should be a monster, an absolute monster, and then you should learn how to control it. Do you know the expression, it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war? Right, right, exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. And that's exactly right. And so when I tell young men that, they think, well, lots of them are competitive. They're low in agreeableness, you know, because that's part of being competitive temperamentally. It's like, is there something wrong with being competitive? There's nothing wrong with it. There's something wrong with cheating. There's something wrong with being a tyrant. There's something wrong with winning unfairly. All of those things are bad. But you don't want people to win? What's the difference between trying to win and striving? You want to eradicate striving? So this is a great question, and I've heard this question come up in many different contexts that I find myself in. And also, Peterson is saying something interesting here about, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with winning or striving. I actually want to rewind it a bit so I can make sure I heard him. Temperamentally. It's like, is there something wrong with being competitive? There's nothing wrong with it. There's something wrong with cheating. Ah. There's something wrong with being a tyrant. There's something wrong with winning unfair. So, yeah, tyranny and cheating. This is what I wanted to respond to. What is the relationship between tyranny and cheating? Ah, good question. What is the, what does it mean to be a tyrant? This is, there's this interesting idea of that's coming up for me right now, which is che cheating is not just about um playing not playing by the rules right because that, that might be what you what one would think of when they think of cheating it's not just about playing by the rules again if we're talking about the transcendent and we're talking about the transcendent as a as a overarching principle which contains us and which we ourselves contain um to play exclusively a game to live your life according to a paradigm of winning and losing and to see everything as an object to be simply one, as opposed to, uh, to, as a thing, right? Eric Fromm, again, being versus having, as a thing to be manipulated, as opposed to a process to be in relationship with, right? This is a form of cheating, arguably. This is a form of cheating. And you're not really cheating the transcendent because you can't cheat the transcendent. You're cheating yourself. And so tyranny is not just about, it's not simply about, um, uh, you know, not playing by the rules. It's actually recognizing which rules are appropriate in which contexts. And when do they become inappropriate? And the rules of trying to win and seeing everything as a matter of dominating your opponent, destroying your opponent, actually not only sometimes, often cheats the opponent, but cheats yourself. Because you start to see this as in, in McGilchrist's Master and His Emissary, right? Classic, brilliant book, and again, where you're seeing everything as an object to be manipulated as a thing that is separate from you to be exploited as opposed to a process to be in relationship with. And the past 3,000 years have been arguably ensconced, enmeshed in that process or in that, in that enlightenment style way of thinking, which is to see everything as an abstract object to be controlled or to have dominance over as opposed to a process to be in relationship with. So the, the entire paradigm that that um, it is presupposed, I guess, to use a word that Peterson loves to use, is presupposed by this conversation is itself questionable. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in, in learning more about this, check out John Verveke's work on opponent processing versus adversarial processing. Um, again, James Carson's book, Infinite Games versus Finite Games. These are all texts that have like informed where I'm coming from all of this, and I apologize if it sounds like I'm using like super, super academic jargon. Um, I know that that can be, uh, uh, I don't know, people can find that very um, just inaccessible. Um, I'll give you a quick example of what I mean by this, though. If someone is having a conversation with me about some politically charged uh, viewpoint, that I disagree with. I, let's say I disagree with their position on on something. Um, uh, pick a topic, any topic. I don't know. Um, abortion. Let's say. So let's let's get really controversial here. Let's say abortion, and let's say this person is is pro life. I'm pro choice. But let's say this person is pro life. Right. I can have I can have a conversation where I'm trying to dominate the conversation, and I'm trying to win the argument, and I'm trying to 
defeat my opponent, right? And I, and if I if I come to them in the in this spirit, then I will simply then I will simply um, try to marshal as many facts as I can, right? As many propositional statements, propositional beliefs as I can, and I will you know hurl it at them, and we'll we'll go into a duel of of your facts versus my facts. But actually, what matters here, what what is probably going to be more impactful is if I can show up in a relational way of being with this person and to actually show them that I can hear where they're coming from and I can hear what, where their orientation lies and be able to still meet them and match them while still simultaneously disagreeing, right? That's a skill set. That's a very, uh, that's a very difficult skill set and it requires cultivation and it, and it's actually much more sophisticated than the warrior in the way that Dr. Peterson is describing it. I mean, it is actually a characteristic of the warrior in the Tao Te Ching sense of the word um, or the, in the Taoist uh, sense of the word, right? Um, so if I can meet a person who's saying all these things, who I fundamentally disagree with, who's through saying all these things actually triggering certain negative responses within me. But if I can actually watch the rising and falling of my ego and watch the rising and falling of my insecurities and not react to those things and watch the rising and falling of this person's ego and watch the rising and falling of this person's insecurity and still respond from a place of curiosity and still still respond from a place of compassion, openness, I am more likely to engender an empathetic response from this person, which will which will actually work more, work more, right? In the long run, again, see if you're working out of this exploitative mindset, if you're working from this transactional mindset and you're trying to get something out of the other person, right? Then it screws up so much of the dynamic. But if we can enter into a relationship where we're actually trying to learn how to relate to each other, knowing that we won't know the outcome in advance, right? Because, and that's what it means to be in relationship with the mystery, the transcendence that Peterson and so many other people in this space like to talk about, right? That's actually far more likely to create something where we can come close to meeting each other. And that's not, that's not the win-lose paradigm. It, it goes beyond the win-lose paradigm. And in fact, it's a paradigm that's more closer to the transcendent principle. Um, okay, so now I'm rambling, so I'm going to continue to play. There's something wrong with winning unfairly. All of those things are bad. But you don't want people to win? What's the difference between trying to win and striving? You want to eradicate striving? Well, it's the uncomfortable feeling that people associate with losing. When they've personally experienced it, they look at losing as they've they've been oppressed or they've been hurt. But what they don't understand is that is the motivation for growth. And one of the most beautiful things that I think a young person can get involved in is martial arts. Because martial arts teach you that in a way that very few things do. They teach you it in especially jujitsu because jujitsu is so complex and there's so many possibilities to it that it attracts a lot of really smart people. If you think of jujitsu, you would think of like brutish individuals engaging in this hard martial art. If you go to a real good jujitsu school, you see nerds. Mm-hmm. You see a bunch of like really smart kids that really get obsessed with the possibilities of this physical language. This physical language also teaches you the consequences of not working hard, of not being prepared, of not understanding positions, of not doing due diligence mm-hmm. and doing the work. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's an, an, amazing, an amazing scaffolding for developing your life. Well, it I also say- teaches... Just got to say, huge fan of martial arts. I love Tai Chi. I try to do like three to five minutes of Tai Chi every morning before my morning meditation. So it's a great way to get into an embodied practice that... Um, that is just healthy overall instead of just sticking in the propositional cerebral hyper intellectual um frame which i'm definitely guilty of doing uh often i do it less now but i still do it is you how to lose yes you know and that's and very important. one definition of a winner is someone who never let losing stop them yes you know and and the idea that a single that. loss in a competition is somehow a defeat is completely insane first of all well, let's say you're a hockey player and you're a good player and you, and you lose the tournament. It's like, well, so what? You played the game. You're increasing your skills. It's like there's always next time. And one of the things that I've also been 
telling people, informing people about is the idea that life isn't a game. It's a series of games. And the oh. right ethic is to be the winner of the series of games. And part of that means you, well, you have to learn how to be a good loser because yes. you're not going to win every single game. But you also have to embrace those losses as learning experiences. And the people that have never lost are afraid of losing. Mm. They're afraid of learning. Mm -hmm. You're afraid of that feeling. That terrible feeling that you get from losing is so beneficial. It's aided me in so many ways. Like, it's one of the reasons, also one of the reasons why I talk so openly about bombing on stage. And I, t I do it with other comedians. Mm -hmm. I, I always want to tell people, yeah, I'm an established comedian. I've been a comedian for a long time. Let me tell you about like when I was two years in or five years in or, or four years ago. Like, let me tell you about some horrible moments on stage where it went wrong. Just so you understand, like those things took me to another place because yep. I realized I don't want to ever feel that feeling again. And so I ramped yeah. everything up and then I went back to work and I went over my notebooks and I went over my, my recordings and I figured out what I was doing wrong and, and I tried to improve upon it. But it, if it wasn't for that horrible, sick feeling, that's the same feeling you get when you get tapped out in jujitsu class. Same feeling you get. When you lose a martial arts tournament or anything else, losing is important. Well, you might also say, like, let's say that you, could pick your you can pick your level of competition in life to some degree. Okay, so let's say you pick a level of competition where you're always winning. It's like, well, all that means is you've picked the wrong level of competition. Yes. Because, you know, like, let's say you're a grandmaster chess player and you're, all you do is play amateurs. And every night you go home and congratulate yourself on what a genius you are because you just stomp these people left, right, and center. It's like, you're not a genius. You're dimwit. Right. What you should be doing is playing people who are beating you like, well, as much as you can tolerate. Right. So maybe that's 40% of the time. Maybe it's 60% of the time. But that way, because to be a winner, you want to be disciplined. You want to know what you're doing. And then you want to be on the edge where your skills are being developed. And if you're going to be on the edge where your skills are going to be developed, you're, you're at a place where losing is always a possibility. Because otherwise, you're not pushing yourself beyond your current capacity. So that was great. Thank you to Jordan Peterson and Joe Rogan for the conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I said what my thoughts are for the most part. Uh, there's a place in certain forms of Buddhism where you get beyond winning and losing, where the paradigm of winning and losing is not even like a thing. Um, perhaps that's a little bit too, uh, I don't know what it is too much of for this conversation, but it's interesting. It's, it's, I do wonder if, if, Jordan Peterson in particular, first of all, what he thinks about Zen Buddhism, Eastern metaphysics. There are aspects of this in uh, Eastern versions of Christianity as well. Um, but yeah, there, there's, there's, there's a paradigm. There are many paradigms that exist beyond this sort of win-lose, um, pain, pleasure, right? The Buddha said you should should seek not neither aversion nor attraction right these are these are there are zen koans that actually break up the very simple binaries that um folks like peterson operate in and i just wonder what role they have to play in these conversations about winning and losing because you know when i'm playing guitar and i'm playing different let's say chords or i'm playing different scales there's like scales that are minor that sound like sadness and there are scales that are major that sound like joy. And in fact, that, that at some point when you're playing between these scales, uh, the, the, the meaning of these scales actually change depending upon what's, what's uh, played before them. So like something that would be norm normally be considered sorrowful is actually sounds like joy when contrasted with, with something else, right? And I think that that's how a lot of these things work. That's, uh, and so it's worth asking like how might loss be a win or how might winning be actually a loss i mean in our very hyper consumerist culture where folks are constantly basically taught that the accumulation of wealth and money and power makes them winners simultaneously fills them with a sense of emptiness inside right because the the way we've painted what it means to win on paper it doesn't actually connect you necessarily to the transcendent right that's the conversation that i would like to see uh, these very important and influential people that I care about, like Dr. Peterson, um, actually talk about. And it's important to talk about it because, quite frankly, there is, and I've seen this, I, I've seen it personally, there is a connection, a spectrum 
between what Dr. Peterson said and what Andrew Tate says, folks like Andrew Tate says. And it's not to say that Peterson endorses what Andrew Tate has said or done, or, but I think that the failure to tease out some of these things and the failure to realize that there actually is something beyond the win-lose paradigm can actually get people stuck, and particularly young men can get them stuck and fixated and fallen into an Andrew Tate-like spiral, um, which is not healthy for, for anyone, least of all not the men um, involved. So those are my thoughts. Another uh, uh, reactive reaction uh, take to Dr. Jordan Peterson, this time in conversation with Joe Rogan. And uh, I hope you got something out of that. And uh, I'll see you next time.